Okay, so if we're talking about the different modes of online youth work, um, I want to show you a presentation based on uh, some ideas of a few people, a particular shout out to Martin Fisher, who is a really talented worker. Um, he's involved with an organization called Game Over Hate, who um, really was the first person I came across talking about these kind of different ideas in youth work. Uh, I'm going to share my screen with you so you can see the uh, presentation and I'll take you through it. So you can talk about a few different modes of online youth work. Um, one being broadcasting information, one being creating interaction, and that could be on a large scale with different communities, and one being facilitating small groups. As well as that, you might be talking about providing one-to-one -one support, and also um, giving learning material online. That's more about creating content that's designed to support people's learning. Um, if we look at, say, the first category, uh, broadcasting, basically that's like you think of traditional media when you think of this. The youth worker is putting out content uh, to lots and lots of information, uh, to lots and lots of individuals. It might be more appropriate even to talk about a youth organisation putting out this content. So the sorts of things and tools you might use for this could be a very traditional website, so a website that's just pretty much about you go online and read some information, publishing informational content on social media, radio broadcasts and podcasting. There's some really interesting youth work that happens um, in Africa actually and, and South America where people use radio broadcasts and, and to send out messages directly from children or young people. You could also put email campaigns in this category. And typically this is what you might call a public broadcast. Um, so it's something you're putting out there in the open that anyone can access. Um, I've got public in inverted commas there because of course the internet isn't necessarily a public space. It might feel and be very much like one, but a lot of the time you're on uh, spaces owned by private entities. Uh, so some examples of that type of work here. On one side we have Minds website, um, giving some great information about um, looking after yourself, mental health and well-being through COVID. Uh, and on the right hand side we have Verk's website, uh, sorry, Verk's Facebook feed. Uh, Verk is a Finnish organization specializing in digital youth work. And you can see they've put out a post here that's really talking about um, misinformation, identifying false news, that kind of stuff. Um, but both of those is really you're just broadcasting that information out to young people. You can take that a little bit of a step further and talk about uh, interaction um, in terms of building large communities of people. Now, people who work in comms and marketing who are a bit more advanced tend to think along these kind of lines. You've still got that basic idea of broadcasting information out, but at the same time, what social media and various tools like that allow you to do is to enable your audience, the people you're talking to, to both talk to each other or to talk back to you. Uh, but not like extensively, not a lot of discussion, just bits and bobs here and there. So what you're doing in this kind of mode, you might be publishing content that's more about encouraging interaction. So you might be doing a Facebook a live stream or streaming a webinar, for example, where people can send in questions as you're talking like that. Um, or you might also be posting a sort of uh, content that's asking people to share their thoughts or feelings or ideas on something. Uh, this, again, you can do in a public space using things like uh, live streams, Facebook groups, but you can also make it into more of a closed space. So you can use apps like WhatsApp groups with a lot of people in, Discord channels, uh, Slack as a tool, which would be a space that you're looking to bring lots and lots of young people into to be able to share that content to them and to create that interaction between them. Um, the advantage when you create that kind of closed space is you can still know exactly who's in it and you can have some sort of process for how people get admitted or not admitted. Um, but you're still really typically looking at large numbers here. What's a little bit more interesting about this type of work and important to recognize is you're typically doing this on a non real time basis. Um, so even if you publish a, a, a live feed or a YouTube stream or something like that, you might be keeping your comments boxes open afterwards for people to continue talking and interacting with you. Or if you bring a large number of people onto a Slack channel or into a Discord group, um, that is almost a semi-permanent space that's uh, open until you basically shut it down. And you don't, you don't shut it down kind of a week later, you leave it running until your project's completely finished or something like that. Um, so what that means as a youth worker, if you start to create that sort of space, on the one hand, you have uh, some control over who comes into it, but 
you're not there all of the time. So uh, you have to think about how people interact in that space, how you might want to moderate a space like that, setting down some ground rules for the groups and that kind of thing. Um, but you can also still do this kind of model on the big open public channels as well. Uh, to give you an example of that, this is Slack. Um, Slack is very much like the kind of old school chat um, rooms used to get of old. Um, I've used it on a project here um, that I did for the European Patients Forum where we have about, uh, over two years, we have about 80 young people involved in it and we've invited them all to join the Slack channel. And that's an important thing is that they wouldn't have been here anyway. We have to do a lot of work to encourage them to join the channel. And then we keep posting content for them to respond to, for people to talk to each other. And people, anyone who's in this channel can post content just as easily as the youth workers in charge of it can. And you'll see on the left hand side, we have a few different sort of uh, channels that people can join into to talk about different topics. Uh, the whole thing together is called a, a workspace, sorry. Um, what I found when you use this sort of approach is you have to work hard to get people in it and you have to keep it active so that you can't actually see very much in, uh, in terms of people's messages uh, on this uh, channel at the moment. And that's really because this, um, this kind of online space died. We didn't maintain it after the project had finished, so people stopped using it bit by bit. All you can see here is a kind of retweet from a Twitter bot we set up. Um, I'm involved with one organization that has this kind of approach that uses it for managing and running itself. We have about 100 to 200 people in a Slack group, um, at Slack workspace, sorry. And I'd say you're probably needing those reasonably large numbers to, to do this kind of sort of thing. And you've got to be really on top of it with keeping that content going to keep the interaction going so that people want to be there and so that people come into the space so they interact with it regularly. Of course, if you use it as a public and an open space where they're going into, say, Facebook or Instagram to do other things anyway, um, you, you don't have that same issue there, but you're not able then to control as easily who's in that space and who isn't. Taking it down a level, we could also talk about online youth work as being online group work. This would be the things a lot of people are doing at the moment. So Zoom, Google Hangouts, GoToMeetings, and that's basically exactly the same as face-to-face -face group work. You get a small number of people there, it happens in real time at a scheduled event, and you are inviting specific people to come into that space and interact with you and do a particular activity. Um, so there's lots of different uh, video chat apps that will do that. Um, Zoom's particularly good uh, because it's got breakout rooms and, and uh, a whiteboard with it. And what I really like to do a lot is combine it with an app called Padlet, which is almost like a digital uh, flip chart and post-it notes. Um, and so if you're mixing uh, video chat, flip chart and post-it notes together, you can do a lot of group work activity with that quite easily. One alternative to mention, which is almost like a version of Slack, which might enable you to do this sort of thing is Discord. I've not really played around much with that myself. Um, I understand you can do live voice and text chat in it. So it gives you that space to do the kind of group work there. And in a way you could almost imagine that this um, is not necessarily a sharp divide between group work and that large scale community building sort of thing. It kind of depends on what you're aiming for and how big your group is, but it's worth trying to have those models in your mind when you're, you're setting something up really. Uh, the key part of this one is that um, all participants can interact fairly equally in this. So, you know, it's much more like sitting with a circle of people um, together in a space. Final style of messaging you can talk about, the final style of online work, uh, work is one-to-one. -one. So using the private messaging functions in social apps, so the, the messaging functions you have on Facebook, on Instagram, using apps that are just uh, dedicated for messaging, so things like WhatsApp, Signal, Telegram, Snapchat. Um, SMS, telephone, um, maybe even email, people still use that, maybe even letters to reach people who aren't actually online. Um, just the same as you might have a one-to-one -one support conversation with the young people, you can do that online. A couple of things that are really important, obviously um, being really clear that you're using uh, not personal accounts for this, that you're using accounts that your, your youth work accounts that are owned by your organization, but also being clear when this is available. Um, so it's fairly obvious if you're running a youth club that um, the times that a young person can come to you for support is uh, when that youth club's open and you could have a one-to-one -one chat with them uh, during that youth club session. Um, when you're online, that boundary is, is not always obvious. You know, you're, you're potentially, uh, your profile can always be seen and accessed. So you have to have a, a couple of things going on really. I think one is being clear when your support is available because the, and when it's not. 
because it's important to remember you're not an emergency service necessarily as a youth worker. So if someone is having a, a crisis at two in the morning, actually they possibly need to go to somewhere like Childline, uh, to somewhere like uh, the police, depending on what the crisis is, um, as opposed to try thinking they can access you, trying to access you and then, and then failing to be able to do that. And so communicating those kind of uh, boundaries is really important. Uh, but there's also a well-being thing going on in there, particularly uh, for people who work in smaller projects. Uh, you know, it's very easy to be there with your mobile phone, um, a notification going off while you're making your dinner, while you're with your um, friends, while you're there in the evening, uh, trying to switch off from work that you can always be reached by young people. So uh, those boundaries of, of, of professional office hours are quite important to both set and communicate in a way. I mean, obviously, it's fantastic for people who can to offer a 24 hour service to young people. Realistically, it's very few organisations that can actually do that. Um, and so the important part is letting people know where they can reach that from those particular organisations. The final mode we could talk about would be learning management systems. You've probably seen these somewhere before. This is almost like um, going onto a website or a web page where you can go on perhaps watch a video about uh, the course topic, um, do some quizzes, maybe interact with some other people taking the course at the same time. It's designed for uh, delivering educational packages to a group of people or to an individual person. Um, lots of tools for that, things like Pathrite, Google Classroom, Canvas, Moodle. Again, you're really talking about an invited space here. So the context you would use this on was if you were used to say running a uh, maybe you run a 12-week course to help people get into work or something like that. You could digitize all of that content, put it on a learning management system and offer it to young people uh, digitally. Um, you can have that just offered individually, one-to-one, -one, or you can also build interaction between people. It's not the most interactive platform, this sort of thing. You might typically use it. Um, this course you can see in front of you here um, was designed uh, by myself and a colleague, a guy called Ed Moss, um, to support um, young people's advocacy. So we have this running alongside uh, a series of webinars as well that, that kind of interact together. Um, yeah, it's a good way of delivering, um, a more designed for formal education, it has to be said, um, a little bit harder to do the kind of interactive elements of youth work. One of the important things I think to think about um, when you're doing online sessions is to really explore um, who has access to things and who doesn't. Um, I'm going to give you a few statistics from the, the UK. Um, if we look at the, this is uh, which social networking sites young people are using, uh, 15 to 25 year olds. Um, uh, the figures for 12 to 15, pretty similar really. Um, so you can see YouTube's very popular, Facebook's very popular. 80% of young people are using YouTube according to this survey. 77% are using Facebook. 71% are using Instagram. What that tells you is a couple of things. Um, one is that if you're going to put your content and do your youth work on a place that people are already using, you're going to have an easier time. Um, if you're going to try and attract them into a specific a place or a tool that you're using, um, you're going to have to do that work to get people there. Now that work could be done by the contacting the people you're already working with directly, advertising to them, encouraging them to join the groups, um, or it could be about recruiting people from scratch really. Um, but it's really an interesting way of thinking about the online space in terms of going to places where young people are and offering interaction, or whether you're trying to bring them into your the space that you're creating. So it's like outreach work versus uh, running a youth club in a way, I guess. Of course, not everyone has access to the internet. This um, survey is the UK Consumer Index. It's, uh, I found it as part of a report called from the Office of the National Statistics, which is exploring the UK's digital divide, basically seeing who's got digital access and who doesn't. Um, I found that in 2018, 12% uh, of those aged 11 to 18 years old in the UK reported having no internet access at home from a computer or a tablet. It's really important to keep in mind that that doesn't say phone there. So actually that probably means there'll be, I don't know, I'd guess maybe another 5% that have access only through a phone. Um, and this figure is really interesting. Both it tells you that um, around about 90% of people have internet access at home. So through digital methods, you can potentially access 
of the people you're working with. But it's obviously really important to think about those people that don't. Uh, a piece of work I've been doing with the um, partnership between the European Union and the Council of Europe in the field of youth, I've been working on a study and a book around uh, social inclusion and digitalization. Some of the messages that are coming out from that, some of the, the reasons why you might think, why people might be excluded from online spaces. One uh, is poverty. Um, if you can't afford broadband connections, you don't have uh, access to them, you can't pay for the data, that kind of thing, that's very important. Another reason might be lack of connectivity in your area. This is particularly about rural areas. Um, it becomes much more of a significant problem outside of the UK, but some of the most rural areas in the UK still don't have broadband access. So that's a thing that can prevent someone engaging in an online space. Um, another thing that prevents access is uh, whether the software is usable. If you're someone with um, someone who's blind, someone who needs to use a screen reader, someone who needs content in a particular sort of way to make it possible for you to engage because of your uh, various learning needs. Um, lots of different software and modes and formats can exclude you uh, very easily. So um, young people with disabilities would be a group I'd be really thinking about as to whether they can access online content. And of course, certainly in the UK, uh, one of the other groups that we know are often excluded from digital content uh, potentially are young people uh, who are in social care. So um, anecdotally, there's certainly um, stories and issues around there of young people not being uh, allowed access to mobile phones and computers, um, certainly young people in chaotic situations, are less likely to have those uh, sorts of things, perhaps. Um, and in some cases, that might be for very good reasons to keep those young people safe. Uh, in other cases, it might be blanket policies. Um, I did a study once on the experiences of young people who run away with the railway children. And one of the huge uh, moments for young people running away was when their mobile phone battery died and they lost digital access that happened sort of two or three days into their journey running away. Um, so these things can be really, really crucial to uh, people in that kind of space. Um, I've really not seen a lot of ways of reaching people without digital access in these kind of Corona times. So, uh, you know, really interested to see what people are doing around that. Um, that's pretty much it for me. I hope that's been uh, useful. I'm going to go back to the, the rest of the webinar.